Kathy Smith and welcome to On Health, The Art of Living, where I bring you the latest information on how to live a healthier, more vibrant life. Now, in the never ending quest for the fountain of youth, people try all sorts of gimmicks and products that promise eternal vitality and radiance. However, true longevity isn't about chasing fads. It's about understanding the science of how our bodies age and making lifestyle choices that promote health span as well as lifespan. Now, my guest today is Bill Gifford. He's an author who's dedicated his entire adult life to researching the fascinating topic of longevity. Now, I first interviewed him about seven years ago when he wrote his New York Times bestseller, Spring Chicken, Live Forever or Die Trying. Now, at that point, he told me this great story that when he turned 40, he was given a cake and on it were the words, rest in peace, my youth. And that prompted him to go on a quest to find a way to slow down or even reverse the aging process. Okay, now Bill has teamed up with Dr. Peter Atia to author the runaway hit, which is called Outlive, The Science and Art of Longevity. Now, this is really a manifesto that has sold over a million copies now, and it's it's helping to redefine our approach to healthcare and how we pursue wellness over treating diseases. One of the book's central theses is, is that the way we approach healthcare has to go in un, uh, just this unbelievable shift. It's just a fundamental shift. It has to go from what they call medicine 2.0 to medicine 3.0. You see, medicine 2.0 is all about diagnosing and treating illnesses, where medicine 3.0 is about preventing diseases and promoting wellness, ultimately extending not only lifespan, but also health span. So here are a few terms you're going to hear today. Centenarian decathlon, marginal decade, and becoming an athlete of life. So get ready to take some notes because today's conversation will be a roadmap for changing your longevity. So hi, Bill, welcome to the show. And, and, you know, as we were just saying, it's been a while since we last talked and then you moved to Salt Lake City. But what I was wondering, my big thing, when I saw your name on the cover of this book that is blowing the world up at this point, meaning everybody is talking about it. When I saw your name on it, I was just wondering, how did you and Dr. Peter Atia connect? And 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 then what inspired the two of you to write this book, Outlive? So reeling back to 2017, end of 2017, I got an email from Peter. I, I had known about him um, in the longevity and medical world. And he had written some interesting things that I'd read and I'd never really spoken to him, but I got an email out of the blue asking if, you know, I could help him, help him write a book. And it was interesting. I, the same week I got emails from three people who were writing longevity books. And two of those books came out a long time ago and ours took five years to write, but I sort of thought that Peter had some interesting, well, we met for dinner and in New York city and he ordered about half the menu and I was like, is that for both of us? It's like, no, no, that's really kind of for me because I'm eating one meal a day and I'm on this fasting plan. So I, he was on a two hour eating window. So we ordered about four entrees at this Turkish restaurant. And I thought, huh, well, this, this, this is going to be interesting, whatever happens. Um, and he had a lot of interesting ideas and he thought differently about medicine and longevity. So I thought, let's, let's give it a whirl. Well, speaking of the different ideas, so that's where I, uh, I want to use that as a jumping off point. So in the book, you you guys mentioned that in the 1900s, you know, we used to die of accidents and infectious diseases and, uh, you know, basically you yep. get injured, that type of thing. And then there was the shift. And anybody listening to the show right now is more likely to die with what you guys call the four horsemen which is the diabetes, cancer, heart disease, and neurodegenerative diseases. And and in that, so one of the book's central thesis is is that the shift from medicine, what you're calling 2.0, to something you're calling medicine 3.0, where you go from treating illnesses to preventing illnesses. So can you just like dive in and start to explain that, how that part of the book evolved. Sure. And and this is really the big idea 
of the book. And a lot of people are focusing on, oh, I should exercise or this or that. But that's really the big idea, sort of a larger overarching idea. So I, I love talking about it. Basically, our medical system evolved in the essentially in the 19th century around the germ theory of disease. So it evolved to treat things like infections or you got you fell off a horse and buggy or you got stabbed or some some terrible thing like that. It was acute, short term, had a definite cause and a and a likely cure, right? You could stitch up the wound. You could treat the infectious disease eventually, uh, especially once we had penicillin. These are very short-term acute problems. And our medical system is still organized around diagnose, treat. But these horseman diseases are, are fundamentally different. And the main way they're different is in terms of their time scale. So just to give you an example, heart disease, when someone has a heart attack, they probably have had heart disease, the process of atherosclerosis developing and going on inside them for decades. They've found in autopsies of like 23 year olds who have died in car accidents, they found that they have the beginnings of atherosclerotic plaques in their arteries. So they're already on the way to this disease. So just coming in at a late stage or when, it, when it's clinically diagnosed, like you're kind of almost too late. So we have to kind of reorient the timeline in which we, we treat a lot of these diseases, such as heart disease, but also diabetes, um, which is also a kind of progression, right? Insulin resistance, hyperinsulinemia, prediabetes, and then diabetes. So we should be, the idea of medicine 3.0 is that we should be intervening or at least paying attention much earlier than we do and trying to steer somebody off the trajectory towards having bad disease or having bad things happen to them, steer them to, on a better trajectory. You know, so you're, you're not getting diabetes. Maybe you're, if you've got pre-diabetes, you can, you can reverse that and go back to metabolic health. Does that make sense? Yeah, perfect sense. And as a matter of fact, a couple things that, that pop up while you, uh, while you were talking, one is, I remember in the book, um, Peter saying that it was just heartbreaking to sit down with a, a woman or a man, you know, six, and you have to say, you, you know, you have cancer and, you know, you probably have six months to live type of thing yeah. or thinking that even if he's not saying it, knowing that if they, if he would have intervened 20 years prior, that they would be having a different discussion. And that's what, what was very, is some very powerful stories in the book. But also what I think is interesting is that you guys now have created not only tactics, but, um, you know, a strategy, let's say to, uh, you know, yeah, to, to live your best life in your 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s. And I think that's what everybody's like jumping on board and, and, and thinking about some of these words, like the centenarian decathlon, the marginal decade, yeah. or being an athlete for life, because that is, um, that is my, you know, since I started exercising when I lost my parents, when I was in my early twenties, uh, uh -huh. it has been this, it, it's been profound, the changes that have happened through my, in my entire body and brain. And yet people tend to focus on the weight or the sculpting mm. the look, you know, like, yeah, thank yeah. You look, thank you look good, you know, type of thing. But it's like, well, yeah, but you can't believe how I feel. So let's use that of... Like just let's go into this idea of uh, the centenary decathlon. I want to know who came up with that because it's brilliant. And uh, what does it mean? So it's interesting when we started writing this book was very much going to be a textbook about the biology of aging and the diseases of aging. And we were going to spend maybe 5% of the time on that kind of strategy stuff. And then it evolved. But the centenary decathlon, it was originally the centenary Olympics. But it turns out there's some trademark issues, um, so you can't really say Olympics. But decath we decided decathlon is better because a decathlete, if you think about it, decathlete is not like the best pole vaulter or the best runner or the best um, whatever the other uh, events are. They they throw it. They throw something right. They throw a discus. 
Yeah. And Sean you know, they do all the events. You could be like the 50th best in the world at each of these events and still be the best decathlete. So the idea is like, you're not focusing on your one single thing, but you're kind of good at everything. And the centenarian part is not meant to be taken literally because not a lot of centenarians can throw a discus, right? But you're meant to be doing all of these things across a broad range of sort of functional fitness, basically until into your 70s, into your 80s and beyond. So essentially it's about, it's really about, you know, for most Americans, certainly the 70s are a period of declining health of sort of impaired health span, as we say. And it's not really a, a fun decade for a lot of people. So it's really about getting your 70s back, getting your 80s back and, and, and essentially living your best life, you know, after, after what we consider retirement age. Yeah. It's, um... it's about not stopping. So that, that's kind of why you, you are, are such an inspiration because, you know, a lot of people like stop doing things and, and you don't, you haven't. And I think that's kind of what the centenary decathlon is about. It's interesting. My uh, son-in-law had his 40th birthday today and we have a thread, uh, a text thread. And I, uh, you know, I said, happy 40th. And then the friend popped in and said, 40s, the 40s are a great decade. And I said, yeah, the 40s are great, but 70s are better. And, you know, it is one of those things that that mentality that that it can be. I am having one of the best decades of my life. I'm turning 73 this year. And I That's think great. I mentioned this to you. I don't know if we talked about it, but I'm doing the 29029. Do you know what that is? Oh, yeah. Is That's that an the, Everest? You climbed, I'm doing it at Whistler. You climb to the top of the mountain. <laughs> gondola down you have to do uh, it the number of times cute. that equal you know cl th close to 30 yeah. 29029 yeah. and you have 36 hours to complete it and but the oh. thing is i think of you two i always call you guys you and peter you two uh all the time because in the book this has like so, been such a help for me with with what things we're going to get into zone two you know vf2 max stabilization but thing where, where there, it's a training that uses all of those principles. And on top of that, the biggie, there's a community, which is just yeah. lit me up like a firecracker as far as being involved with a group of people with a similar goal. So you're exchanging things like, what kind of headlamps do we use? I mean, what are the best, you know, wool socks? And those little things are so much fun to bring a group together. So I really appreciate this. Um, I, you know, I appreciate, you know, it all, but, you know, I want to bounce back. I think maybe I skipped out of it too quickly and I don't want to ignore the medicine side of this okay. because it has been a pet peeve of mine for decades mm. that uh, when I go to the doctor um, that I'm a number. And so when I go in there, mm. I mean, they look at me, Kathy Smith, I feel like saying, do you know who you're talking to? And then it's like, do you exercise? <laughs> do, do you exercise? Do you eat enough vegetables every week? You know, they ask some, you know, basic, or, or you fill out this form, you know, can you stand on, you know, can you remember three words type of thing, which is fine. I mean, they're doing something. But the personal aspect of it isn't there. And so even yeah. the questions that yeah. I have for a doctor that I would <laughs> like to talk to my doctor about, they don't know. And so that has been a little frustrating for me. And so therefore, now that was, uh, you know, as, as I've talked about many times, when I got into fitness, doctors were smoking cigarettes and saying exercise for women is not great and you won't be able to get pregnant. Yeah. This is the, this yeah. is the yeah. you know, this is the early seventies and yeah. Don't and, drink water. Yeah. Yeah, okay. exactly. Yeah. That type of thing. So it's changed and there's been a change and, and if there's been a shift, but I've noticed it's, it's gotten, you know, it's, it's rolling along going at a faster speed, but where do you think, where, where would you rate the medical system right now? Oh boy. Well, we've had, a my partner and I have had a lot of, unfortunately contact with the medical system in the past year um, because of, you know, something that she went through. Unfortunately, she's fine, but, you know, a lot of this care is 
dictated by these kind of broad guidelines, which is essentially an algorithm. So it's kind of like a one size fits all solution for everybody, regardless of your ethnic background, your age, your own goals, what you can be motivated to do. You know, so it's very algorithmic. It's very one size fits all. And, and this is outside of the scope of the book, but the business model, you know, if you go to the, you know, some of the bigger healthcare, healthcare systems where we live and anywhere really, um, these are like big businesses and, and, and they, not to sound cynical, but like they don't necessarily, it's not in their interest for the doctor to develop a relationship with you, a personal, a know you, you know, they just can't, there's just not enough time. And all that kind of stuff has kind of been squeezed out of the system. And it's very focused on basically overbilling you for whatever they do and, and trying to find things to do, you know, procedures, uh, medications to put you on. Again, that's a little bit outside the scope of Outlive, right. but it's really a business model problem. Then another problem is, you know, if you have health insurance, your health insurance carrier, you know, you'd think that they would want to keep you healthy so they don't have to spend money. But actually, the statistics show that people, just like people change jobs now, we change insurance carriers pretty frequently, right? So three, four years, they just want to kind of, you know, kick the can down the road and not assume your sort of total lifelong risk. So again, if there's one insurance company that that knew it was going to have you as a patient until the day you died, it would be like, we want to keep this, we want to keep Kathy as healthy as possible for that entire period, if that makes sense. So that's all very businessy. Right. But but it's kind of okay. a, a business model. Well, we're going in the right direction. It sounds like we're maybe making some progress, um, but there is a ways to go. Um, the response from doctors to this book has been amazing. You know, we talked to a lot of doctors over the last year and time after time, they'd be like, you wrote that book. I've recommended it to my entire practice. I've had everybody read it. All my friends are reading it. So it really, and I thought doctors would be kind of bad, but, but it really has, has struck a chord with, with a lot of um, medical people that I've run into. So that's been really kind of amazing to see. Same, same thing on my side. Lots of doctors that I know are picking it up and I love it. quoting from it. So in the book, this this makes my, me light up. Uh, there's a line that says, exercise is by far the most potent longevity drug. <laughs> <laughs> the fitter you are, and this is a quote, the fitter you are, the lower your risk of death. Again, there's yep. no intervention, drug or otherwise, that can rival this magnitude of benefit. It's obviously not a revelation. So this is for me. It's obviously not a revelation that exercise is good for for you. But yeah. then let's talk about how profound are the effects. And why don't you just like go over it a little bit? You know, there have been there were different studies that we looked at, but but one of the um, key indicators was VO two max. So your maximum ability to use oxygen, and this. The statistics on that are kind of incredible. Like somebody, somebody at, at the so if you if you stratify, stratify people by you know by their age group and if you take like the top quarter of people, they have so the the, the bottom quarter of people have a four times higher mortality risk, all cause mortality risk than the top quarter. So that's bigger than like having diabetes that's bigger than smoking it's bigger than having like kidney disease and then if you take the this top sliver like the top 2.5 percent that elite sliver at the top for their age group it's a five-fold or more difference between the lower quartile and so and then the same goes for for, for strength and grip strength and, and one of the interesting things that i just noticed as i was doing some research for a talk um you know, the greater your grip strength, the the lower your mortality risk. And that holds across the board, across dozens of studies. So grip strength, you know, it's hard, how hard you can squeeze the little stress ball, but, but it's really muscle strength. It's like the proxy for muscle strength. 
And the interesting yeah, it's like an is, indicator of what's upstream from the from the grip, right? It's it's a, yeah, yeah, it's, it's everything. What's happening in your buys, your shoulders, and throughout your body, yeah. which is kind of amazing. But the the really interesting thing that I just saw uh, a few weeks ago is that so for men, there's a there's a plateau to the benefits. So we can go to the gym all we want, but we'll hit a plateau where our grip strength no longer really is correlated with, with decreased mortality risk. But for women in this study, it was across many countries, there's no limit. So, which is kind of interesting because culturally women are kind of not as encouraged to do as much strength training. Whereas we men are kind of almost like pressured into it. Like we got to have like the big biceps and everything. So, and, and women are ultimately, if you think about the centenary decathlon and older age are far more susceptible to frailty and, and loss of muscle. So that to me was like a revelation, like women really need to, to, to keep up the strength work, especially to maintain function, you know, throughout their lives. For their muscles as well as their bones, correct? Yeah, 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 absolutely. But let's get back to just VO2 and that being yeah. probably the biggest indicator of longevity. Can you explain to our audience what is VO2 and and let's talk about some ways of training it. But what exactly does V? I mean, we know it has something to do with oxygen and cardiovascular system, but what exactly is it? Yeah, so it's the rate at which your body can use oxygen so you can get oxygen to your muscles. So I'm sitting here talking to you and we're not using very much oxygen at all. I think I'm, I'm not, I'm, if I say an exact number, it'll, it'll be a misquote. But then if we go walk around the block, we're using then a multiple of that. So maybe like a liter per minute, let's say. But then if you start running, you use more and more. And then if you start running fast, you're using more and more and more. And then eventually you reach a limit at which you're, you're no longer your muscles are taking up all the oxygen that they can and your in your heart is providing that oxygen at the, the maximal rate. So that's your VO2 max. It's it's really relevant only for like elite athletes, it, but it, it, it's a way to quantify cardiorespiratory fitness. Um, so, it's so a really horrible of... test to take. It's okay. a terrible test to take. Like you go till with a horrible mask on and you're suffocating and it analyzes your, your inhales and exhales and you go basically until you can't go any harder. Well, for me, um, I haven't had a VO2 test, uh, but what I, but I, but what I do and what I, and I follow a protocol that I've done through my life, but then you also recommend in the book. And this is the idea of, of getting out and pushing it. So, and, and it, not the necessarily 30 seconds or 90 second hit training, you know, high intensity interval training, but lengthen that. And I've been doing that recently. It's made a big difference. So I go yeah, out yeah. and, um, you know, I, I look at an eight, uh, eight to 10 minutes, uh, but like an eight minute push. And I find, a, a you know, a level that I can, you know, push through for eight minutes. But for me, it's always been because I'm very, and you know, I've listened to my body and you start to see the indicators. How much am I sweating? You know, how, how am I feeling? What is my, what does my breath feel like? Can I yeah. keep going? Yeah. And so for me, it's, you know, what I would tell people and I, when I'm training people or whatever, it's like, you know, you go to where, when you're at the end of that eight minutes, you need to stop. It's not like I want, you know, it's not like I, yeah. I can stop. Yeah. It's like, you have to stop. You have pushed yourself to that point. And I was doing that for a while. I, you know, I, you know, there was, you know, a couple of years ago, it, it really happened after COVID. And then we had that really 2022, we had that, that insane, as you know, Bill, cause you live up here, that insane winter. And, yeah. you know, there was just one of the things that we all get to sometimes in our life, which is just like, I don't actually want to go outside and you know train harder. <laughs> And so what, what happens, and this is the thing about aging, you realize you can lose the motivation and you can start losing, you know, start losing it a bit, uh, the, 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 the fitness. Yeah. So anyway, I got back into it and like anything, 
you can train your body and you, you know, to, and it improves. And if you give it time and you're consistent after two months, after three months. So now I'm at a point now where I feel so strong and I'm not ignoring that part of the workout and in favor of the other, the other zone that I want to go to, which is the buzz and with all of the athletes and with everybody, there's zone two training that's yeah, gained such yeah. a popular, it's such a buzzword right now. So can you explain what zone two training is and why that's important and different from like our zone five training, which is this high intensity? So I'm going to pull it back a little bit and okay. say, so kind of what you're doing is you, you were, you were being and this is one of my favorite lines from the book, but you're being an athlete of life, right? Mm -hmm. And and the, kind of the way you're doing this is you've, you've set this goal for yourself with the 2029 challenge. And I think it's really important for people to have a goal like that and, and something that you're quote unquote training for. And it has to be like a little bit out of your comfort zone, which clearly yours is, but then that forces you to, you know, be consistent over months and months, it forces you to have something like a plan. It forces you to, to, to vary the intensity so you get better results. And so you start, you know, you've been athletic all your life, but I think a lot of people have, and I think it helps a lot of people to, to get into that kind of athlete mindset where they're listening to their body and, you know, how hard can you go? What does hard feel like? What does really, really hard feel like? What does an easy cruise feel like? And that's zone two. And, and so I'm, I'm, it's kind of a long way to, to get to zone two. And zone two is the fundamental um, kind of form of training that, that most endurance athletes do, whether they're runners or cyclists or even swimmers. And counterintuitively, it's not hard. It's kind of a in between a, a walk and a, like a run pace. So let's say if you're a runner, it would be a pace at which you feel like you could run for like an hour or more. It's it. We used to, originally in the book, we called it all day pace. So, so a pace you feel like you can sustain for, so if you're hiking or whatever, I could do this for hours. And that that's like a, it's like a basic endurance pace. You're not going too hard. A lot of people, especially guys like to go too hard but you're going at a, at a purely, you know, if you get down to the molecular biology of it, you're producing energy entirely via aerobic respiration. So you're not, you're not anywhere close to like a sprint. It's all mitochondrial respiration using oxygen to create power. And you can, you can do that pretty much indefinitely. I have been training much more zone two and I, and I distinguish that between zone three. And let me, let me explain one of the things in this uh, event that I'm doing, what comes along with the, the fee that you pay and the, the 36 hours on the Hill is you get a four, four and a half month coaching uh, series. Oh, nice. And, and so it's really quite great. But, and, uh, but one of the things they emphasize over and over is that think about zone two and think slow, slower than you normally would, because they, and, and this is what I want to get across to my audience also, uh, a, a really important part that I've gotten out of this is that we all tend to train a little bit more in zone three, like it's not super hard, but it's not yeah. super easy. And because we're not doing one or the other, it's still taxing our body. So we're not really able to go faster. Maybe we're not really building yeah. strength yeah. and we're really not recovering. So it can, can, and I, I, I found myself literally in zone two. I have to like go slow down. Yeah. You know, just... yeah. Co coaches hate that like mediocre middle because you're kind of not getting the benefit. The zones are all about using different energy systems. Right. And so you're using a different energy system when you're, when you're going hard for your eight minutes than you are when you're just kind of trucking along in zone two. And zone two is awesome because um, your, your mitochondria are burning glucose and fat as well. So they're flexible. And fat is obviously a much more plentiful and sustainable fuel source. So when you're going for 36 hours or however long it takes you, you're gonna wanna rely on, you know, sorry, those fat stores that might be lurking around on you somewhere because um, it's just a much more sustainable 
fuel and you're gonna need glucose as well. But, but you know, zone two, it enhances your ability to, to, to deal with, to, to, cons to utilize both as fuels. And it feels kind I mean, and once you, it's almost like giving yourself permission to just yeah, yeah, chill. Yeah. And I love that. Yeah, no, I love that. Yeah, I love that as a, as a, yeah, as a cyclist. Yeah. I love like easy ride. Easy, know? yeah. Zone one is good too, by the way. Yes, you know, I know. And by the way, this is like, here's, here's uh, the coaches, Coach Brent and Coach Chris. They go, just remember, after you finish that fourth hour, after you finish the sixth hour, you have 30 more to go. So don't, and the, the, so the, their big thing is, it's not, it's, it's not the speed demon that, get, that, that finishes. It, it's a, it's a walking meditation. So you better yeah. get, you know, like, yeah. start liking yourself in the, and the outdoors, because you're going to be with your thoughts for the next 36 hours. So, uh, okay, let's pop over into one of uh, my favorite, another favorite chapter, which is and I don't think it's talked about enough. And it's the, it was called the gospel of stability. Oh, and, yeah. and you, you know, you really talked about relearning how to move to prevent injuries. And this is, this is what I thought was an interesting fact that I got out of it. It's, you know, they said, you don't, or you guys said, you don't fit, uh, you don't see a lot of fit people in their seventies and eighties. Uh, and that's usually the exception, not the rule. And it, you know, it's tempting to think that it's about aging and it's about, uh, aches and pains and middle age, uh, you know, the middle age spread, but besides weight gain and poor sleep that might wipe you out, the thing that wipes a lot of people out are injuries. And if we're yeah, not injured, yeah. and I'm noticing a lot of my friends in their sixties are going through this now, horrible back pain, horrible knee pain, horrible, like this and that. And if you're in, uh, if you're injured or have a lot of pain, then it's hard to be active. And so yeah. then you, yeah. you tie that into stability. So now that was a long winded way of saying, how does the gospel stability, try, uh, you know, factor in? You know, a, a couple of different ways, but, but really it's about, you know, as you do any fitness program, you have to think about, especially if you're, you know, over a certain age, you have to think about, and even if you're younger, you have to think about avoiding injury because, you know, as you, get older, but even if you're like 40, you know, an injury can, can derail you temporarily or, or, or permanently. Um, so I think about like, if someone just decides to go out and start running, right, just right up off the couch with no training or no um, strength building, or, you know, they're just going right out and training for a, a 10K. I mean, that person is very likely to get injured. And because running, running is a very stressful, I'm not saying running is bad, but it's a very stressful activity on the body. So maybe like start out walking or start out, you know, working on balance and working on, you know, leg strength and all that, all that kind of stuff. So stability is really about having a foundation that then gives you the ability to, let's say, if you go skiing and all that snow that we have, you can resist injury, right? You're strong enough to resist injury and you can build it in different ways. And there's different theories about it, but it sort of incorporates um, a lot of sort of basic strength, especially lower body, um, body position. So body awareness um, and then balance is really important as well. And also I would add flexibility. So I'm kind of talking about like you can get a lot of the way there with like a really good yoga class. Right. Um, you know, the one exercise that I do all the time now that has really helped me as far as stabilization around the knees is this um, slow, you know, you step up on a 20 inch bench or a, a bench, and then you slowly lower yourself on one leg um, yeah. to a count of six or eight. And that what, while keeping your knee over your toe and uh, just in control and gain, maintaining. And one of the things I had to do for my training today for the, the before I jumped on with you was 200 step ups, a uh, box <laughs> step ups, 200 on a 20 inch box. But I do wow. about 30 of those uh, with a slow, with that deceleration, with that slow. Yeah, that's hard. 
And yeah. that, but but what I've noticed once again, my knee, the stabilization around that knee joint has been amazing. So that I got that from the book. So that was one of the things I really appreciated. I know we don't have um lots of time, but I, I know I get a lot of questions about this. And in your book, I thought it was uh, interesting that there's one mac macronutrient you mentioned that yeah. demands more attention as we age. And, you know, we, we hear about the carbs, we hear about uh, the fats, but you mentioned it's protein. So why is protein important? And what, ha what did you find uh, that we should be more aware of when it comes to protein? It's interesting. Um, as this book evolved, you know, one of the interesting things about Peter is that his thinking changes as he, he sort of digests new data. And so in the original iteration, we barely talked about protein at all. It was all about carbs, a little about fat, and then came back to it and started looking at some, some newer research that, that suggests that, that often with older people losing muscle mass or older people having a hard time regaining muscle mass, often the missing ingredient is extra protein. And so, you know, there's some, and again, I'm going to misquote it, but, but there's, you know, some baseline recommendation for how much protein we need, which is, I think, way too low. And so there have been various studies that suggest that, that you need to almost do like 50% more than that. Or more, I think like one gram per pound of body weight. I might be misquoting that, but yeah. Uh, but protein is essential for rebuilding muscle. And muscle loss, you know, I think is a really underappreciated um, driver of declining health among older people, loss of independence. You know, these things that we don't really want to think about with aging, but that we've all seen with our parents and our friends. So it goes back to what I was, we were talking about with strength training, you know, the, the, the complement to that is eating enough protein. Now you don't have to go crazy, but you know, you ne definitely need more than the, the, the minimum recommendation. Well, the tagline on my website is strong women stay young. And um, True. through the years, I mean, I have watched the different uh, research studies and, and read them and um, just start incorporating more uh, more strength training in my own routine and then helping other people and other women incorporate it into their routines. Because as you mentioned right. earlier in the show, it's not something that typically, especially women of my generation or even a few decades younger than I am, uh, you know, typically have been doing. Nope. It's, it's shifting now, it's shifting a bit with the younger, younger audience, but, um, I really do believe that that is uh, part of the fountain of youth is maintaining muscle mass. And those two go hand in hand, strength training with protein. And um, even to the fact of making sure that you're getting protein throughout the day and not waiting yeah, until yeah. your evening, evening meal, let's say, right. to have your protein, but making sure you're getting it first thing in the morning uh, or, you know, or in the right. morning. Because you yeah. can't absorb a giant you know, a huge serving of protein all at once. So you take it all at once. You know, I'm thinking of my mom who's in her eighties um, and she's very much of the generation that didn't, you know, she needs to do strength training and I'm, I'm trying to convince her to, but I'm so far not successful. Let me talk to her. <laughs> okay. I will. I'll put you in touch. I'll put you. Okay. But what you're talking about is question. interesting. Was, uh, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. So, you, you're, since we're talking about women, I mean, if you look at the life course and, um, you know, obviously many more women than men live to these very old ages. So if you get to the centenary decathlon, it's going to be a very big women's field. And so men tend to die more suddenly or more quickly and women kind of hang on. Um, and, and so therefore it's just that much more important to maintain that, that physical component of health span so that you can live on your own and, and, you know, be independent and, and do all those activities of daily life, which you may not think require muscle, but, but you need to have the muscle now so that you can get to that point and still be in, in, in pretty good functional shape. And avoid 
that or at least shrink that marginal decade or what you're yeah. calling this decade yeah. that that you're you know you're you're you really are diminished in in um strength and, and all sorts of things so you're it's just not the yeah. quality of life you want now yeah. um you brought it back up i don't think we hit it earlier in the show but the centenary decathlon one of the things you say in the book is make a list get a list out make a list of what do you want to be doing in your 60s 70s 80s i mean and then and make it specific personalize it do you want to be lifting a 25 pound grandbaby out of a crib do you want to be yeah. uh, hiking up for a sunset uh you know, to watch the sunset do you want to be able to uh climb a flight of stairs at a, at a at a decent speed uh whatever it might be for you as an individual um write it down and then now and this is what the book is so great at then it's creating the template what do you need to do now to start to to make sure that by the time you get to those 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 decades you have the grip strength you have the leg leg strength you've worked your posterior chain you you know and and so that you have strength throughout your body so you're capable of doing these things and for me that's what was exciting about it it's like if there's a there's a purpose for all this beyond yeah, yeah. the short term and, and uh, you know beyond the short term so anything else you want to add to that and while you're th while you're thinking of answering that question also what, what was something a book that wasn't obvious to you and what were the biggest changes you made in your life during this five-year period where you're getting all this research and you go hmm. damn i didn't know that i need to start doing that or were there any of these aha moments for you that you change your lifestyle at all? You know, it was interesting. One of the biggest surprises to me was the connection between sleep and metabolic health. Like, you know, sleep's important for cognition and brain performance and even physical performance. But like the fact that, that just a few nights of, of really bad sleep can, can knock you down the road towards insulin resistance was, was kind of, Kind of shocking to me because you know I I come from a long line of of terrible sleepers right and so that became a focus and sleeping is still a bit of a struggle uh, for me sometimes but but I think that was like the importance of sleep was was a, to to all aspects of your health was was quite a revelation to me. So even so, some it's a of the so some of the belly fat that you might be oh, accumulating yeah. could be not just how many calories you're eating or you know expending, but how how good your sleep is. Yeah, absolutely, and and sleep is is really complicated. And in the book, we really just kind of scratch the surface, but but there's a lot of there's so many factors that go in to sleep, like how much exercise you got that day. Um, did you see the sun that day? Um, how is your mental state? You know, are you anxiety ridden? Um, how's your, you know, how's your work life going? Uh, what did you eat? Like, how much did you drink? It's like all together. Like, when did you have your last cup of coffee? You know, are you a slow coffee metabolizer like me? So I can't, so a big change I made, no more coffee after about, about noon, essentially, you know, my coffee cup is empty. I love coffee, but um, so really the focus on sleep has been the biggest change. I'm wearing my little aura ring. All right. So, you know, you get your data to track you got, it. You, you, you yeah. got your data, which you, <laughs> I'm, I'm, plus, I, I don't I'm, think it's a hundred percent down in that yeah. kind of stuff. It's like people, it's oh, like, yeah. you get performance <laughs> no. anxiety for your aura ring. So yeah, exactly. I have to take it off. <laughs> like, you know, we're just going to break up for tonight and I'm just going <laughs> to, um, no, I, um, yeah, sleep is is really really important. I think my I I don't know. I'm trying to think. My biggest takeaway from the book, um, I, I you know I think it it has to do with um, just getting a routine, getting into a routine that's more strategic about, for your life, and not yeah. just uh, you know and and when you do and and get a kind of group of people that are doing it, it becomes it becomes a lot of fun. But it's not just one thing. Strength's important. The O2 max is important. Zone two is important. Stabilization is important. And it sounds like, well, how do I do all that? But honestly, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. about consistency and you can do it all. And it can be, it doesn't have to be 
a lot. It just has to be consistent. And so that was, that yeah. was kind of yeah. a takeaway. Um, Interesting. The, and, and yeah. Anything else you want to add to that? Sorry. Yeah. So, so that's actually a great point. And I think you could read the book and think like, and see content on the internet and think like, oh my gosh, this has to be like a job and I have to go perform my VO2 max intervals, four by four, four minutes on, four minutes off and, and do everything. And like, there's, first of all, there's kind of not enough time in a day to do that. So you have to figure out how to make these things kind of more a part of your life. And then the other key point is that, that a, a lot of the, the, the biggest gains can be made going from zero to one, right? So from doing nothing to doing a little bit. So if you go from zero to like half hour of activity a day, that's a big, big change. That's gonna improve your life. So it, it's, to me, it's less about like being 90% of the way there and trying to go for the last 10. So for me, it's really about like, how can we get people who don't pay attention or don't to their diet or their sleep or their exercise. And, and how do you go from, from not doing anything to doing, to starting? How do you start? Well, on that note, I will tell the audience that one way you can start is picking up the book Outlive. And, uh, and as a reminder on this book, it is, it's dense. It's got a lot of science yeah, in it. Yeah. And but I reread a lot of chapters. It's also one of these books that you can, you know, once you kind of scroll, scroll through the table of contents and get a feel of how the book is laid out, you know, you might go to the the section on stabilization or go to the section on nutrition, um, and find something and then and then just live with it for a while because this isn't like a quick read. This isn't. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what you guys were drinking. You, you were, you it wasn't were, a quick write either. Yeah. You, you weren't putting your coffee down at noon. I can tell you that when you're yeah, 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 yeah. it's a, it, it's a lot. And I loved it. I also got it on audible and, um, and, um, or did I get it on audible? I'm, I'm not sure about that one. I, I, I listened to a lot on audible, but I loved underlining in this book. So um, it's a book to underline for sure. And, and tag and flag. It's a book to underline and tag and flag. Exactly. That's what I have. I have a green. You know, eye. I, I, I change my markers between a light blue and a green and I have them, you know, the whole book tagged up, but um, well, anyway, Bill, it's once again. So I hope we don't have to wait another seven years to do this again. It's too much fun. Uh, and maybe I'm we'll get out working for on hiking. another book right now. So maybe, uh, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're, you're writing great, another one yeah. right now. Yeah, yeah, it's health related. It's not so much longevity, but it's it's a it's something that was kind of mentioned in Outlive that I'm going a little deeper on. Oh, a tease! I like that. Yeah, I like yeah. a tease. Yeah. Okay, so it's something that people can <laughs> use to improve their health and their quality of life, also. Oh, now you really so, have me interested. Yeah. So anyway, well, it's always a pleasure and I appreciate you taking the time. I Likewise. know you're busy and uh, we'll stay in touch and we'll Not too busy uh, for you. talk soon. Okay, bye-bye. Nice to see you, Kathy. This is great. It was such a pleasure having Bill Gifford as a repeat guest on the show. So as an advocate for health and fitness my entire life, I want to thank Bill Gifford and Dr. Peter Atia for writing Outlive the science and art of longevity. Now there's a reason why this book has been on the New York Times bestseller list for over a year. It's incredible. And here's my big takeaway. A little exercise goes a long way. Moving from being a couch potato to doing a little bit really reduces the risks of morbidity and mortality. And it's pretty obvious that exercise is good for you. We've talked about this week after week. That's not the revelation. What's amazing is the magnitude or the, the, the magnitude of the effect on ec of exercise on all health outcomes. So in side-by-side -side comparisons of exercise and drug in trials, exercise trials perform as well, sometimes better than drug interventions on things like diabetes, stroke outcomes, cardiovascular disease. It is true that exercise is medicine. And we really don't need to argue about cardio or weights, which is better. Should I do cardio? Should I do weights? Because they are both great. They, there's arguments for both of them, but both of them are beneficial. Both of them are important, important, and you should be doing both of them. 
So if you'd like to listen to the last podcast with Bill, then check out episode 27. He was on very early when I started doing my podcast. As a quick reminder, these podcasts are great to listen to while you're walking. I call it walk and talk. You walk, I talk. You get to burn while listening to something new. There's more than a hundred episodes now in the archives. So go and find something that you know turns you on. If you're interested in strengthening your microbiome, which is arguably the center of human health, then check out Dr. Will Bulsiewicz, or as we call him, Dr. B. That's episode 96. Or you might want to discover a step-by-step approach to guide you through the menopausal phases from pre to post. In that case, you want to listen to Felice Gersh on episode 95. Also, remember that uh, reviews are really, really important. They're a lifeline for podcasters like myself. So if you like what you hear, go leave a review. I really would appreciate it. And please subscribe to the podcast either on Spotify or Apple. In both places, you can leave those reviews. If you have any questions for me, leave me a topic or a question you might have or guests that you might recommend. I always like to hear what you're thinking about and what you'd like to hear more about. Leave comments of any sort. I love reading the comments. I love getting feedback and I really do appreciate it. So until next episode, I really do love you guys. Bye to everyone and here's to your health.